shall continually be in my mouth. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. We're going to join to sing together to begin our service in uh, number 768 in our blue hymn books. Through all the changing scenes of life, in trouble and in joy, the praises of my God shall still my heart and tongue employ. Number 768. <laughs> As we sit then, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we gladly bow before you this morning. Some of us, no doubt, coming here today with hearts lightened by the spring sunshine. And our personal world's also light and full of joy. But others also surely under clouds of darkness. 
many things spreading over their lives, struggles, hardship, perhaps tragedy and loss. And yet we ask, Lord, that you would indeed touch our hearts, all of us, so that the praises of our hearts and our tongues might indeed be real and might be true before you, whatever our circumstances, whether in trouble or in joy. Help us, Lord, we pray, to truly bless your name at all times. Because as we've read, it is those who look to you and those alone whose faces are radiant, whose faces will never be ashamed because you are the God who is good and kind. You're the one who's always near us. Indeed, your angels do camp around the dwellings of those who fear you so that your hand is there to deliver us on every side to guard us, to protect us in the way everlasting. And so, almighty and merciful God, who sees that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves, keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversaries and from all adversities of the body and all things that might assault and hurt our souls. And we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, a warm welcome to uh, all of you here this morning with us, and a very special welcome uh, to those who are uh, with us this morning for these baptisms. You'll see from our sheets that we have two baptisms this morning. We have uh, Callum uh, Cameron and also Solomon Stephen, who are going to be uh, baptized here. And their parents are bringing their little ones here for Christian baptism. And so before we proceed with that, let me explain a little bit about what this is all about for those of you who perhaps are are unfamiliar uh, and don't really understand. Listen to the words of the institution of this holy sacrament of baptism as they're delivered by our Lord Jesus to his disciples after his resurrection and just before his ascension into the glory of God. Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And lo, he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, Jesus is talking there about the fulfillment of prophecy. Prophets had foretold a day when God's Messiah would do a new thing on earth, no longer just chiefly among the Jewish people, the people of Israel, although it was always a greater blessing than merely to them, but it was chiefly focused upon them. But now, at last, for every people on this earth, for every tribe and language and nation, a great new thing a people belonging to God, cleansed by the grace of the gospel in our Lord Jesus Christ. So Ezekiel had prophesied thus, In those days I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. And I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Likewise, the prophet Joel spoke of those days and said, In those days I will pour out my spirit upon you. And so... No longer is the sign of belonging to God's household a mark in the flesh, the the circumcision that outwardly divided Jew from Gentile. But now the apostle tells us neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. What counts is new creation in Christ. And the sacrament of baptism thus instituted is a sign and a seal of God's covenant grace in this new age, this age of fulfillment. And it speaks of fulfillment, fulfillment once and for all of all the repetitive washings and sprinklings of the Old Testament order in our Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks of our engrafting into Christ through the once and for all forgiveness of sins by his sprinkled blood. And it speaks of 
the regeneration that comes through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon all his people in this gospel age. And so it preaches to us the wonderful gospel of adoption into his family and of the sure and certain hope of resurrection to everlasting life. Although, of course, little children don't yet understand these things, the promise is also to them because children born to believing parents have by their birth an interest in this covenant. They're heirs of the covenant of grace. Paul says they're set apart as holy. And therefore, they're entitled to the seal and to the sign of that covenant, which is baptism. There's nothing magic about this act of baptizing with water. It's simply a visible word of that great gospel grace. And in this sacrament of baptism, God is once again saying, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them, for of such is the kingdom of God. And Christian parents are simply responding in faith and saying, yes, that is what we want also for our children. So this covenant act of baptizing helpless infants is a standing witness to the priority in the gospel. And that is a priority of grace over faith. God's grace overshadows these little ones. And God declares himself graciously inclined to them. And so in baptizing these little ones, we're simply proclaiming to the whole world the true gospel. We're telling the world that what God does for us, he does without our merit. Indeed, he does it without even our knowledge. Perhaps more plainly in baptizing a little one than anywhere else, we can see with our own eyes this truth. That when God commends his love towards us, he does it while we were out without strength, while we were still sinners. Because as Paul says, it was when we were still without strength that Christ died for us. And so in the gospel, the word of God's grace comes to us freely comes without a waiting for a response on our part. And yet, of course, God's gospel word never comes to us without also calling for a response on our part, without calling us to the true obedience of faith. And so this is a word in baptism that we proclaim, but we never proclaim it lightly because it calls for real faith. It calls for real trust. In due time, of course, from these little ones as they grow up, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But even now, in bringing them for baptism, it calls for faith and trust from their parents who are entrusting their little ones into the hands and into the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has promised us great and gracious things as Christian parents. And we must take him seriously. And we do that by showing our trust in his gospel grace. And promising and committing ourselves to bring up our children, not in fear, but in faith and trust that our children are the Lord's, that they belong to him. And we will lead them in that way as we are commanded to in scripture, to bring them up in the knowledge and in the admonition of the way of our God and in the way of discipleship to our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's the duty then of those who are Christian parents bringing their children for baptism to confess that faith into which they're baptized and to promise before Almighty God to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of faith. And so Kenny and Sharon and Alistair and Jen, would you come forward? Kenny and Sharon and Alistair and Jen, and especially... Kenny, you and Alistair, as under God, the heads, the leaders of your households of faith. These little ones, Solomon and Callum, they will depend chiefly on you, all of you, for your help, for your prayers, and for your encouragement in the Christian faith. So I need to ask you, in presenting these ones for baptism, do you confess your trust in God as your Heavenly Father? and in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and as the, in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier. And do you promise then, depending on God's grace, to teach them the truths and the duties of the Christian faith, and by prayer and precept and example, bring these boys up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
All of us also who are gathered here today as the household of faith in this Christian family, all of us bear responsibility along with these families for these little ones. We also, in the church, are called to play our part in their nurture by our prayers, by our teaching, and also by our example to them. And that's a challenge, isn't it? Every day of our lives. We are here to encourage these families and to encourage these little ones to walk in the way of the Lord Jesus Christ all the days of their lives. And so to mark that solidarity in which we stand, I'm going to ask all of you in the congregation to stand now with them. So, Solomon and Callum, your parents are claiming for you both the privileges but also the great responsibilities of belonging to the family that bears the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We now baptize you solemnly. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you all the days of your life. And Callum, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty be upon you and remain with you all the days of your lives. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so, according to Christ's commandment, Solomon and Callum are welcomed into this family and fold of Christ's church, engaged, set apart, to grow up in him and to grow up into him and to be faithful servants and indeed soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ all the days of their lives. And to that end, we work in faith and in trust to teach them, to pray for them, and to show them that great way of salvation. And so as we stand, let's pray together. O Lord, great and gracious, Lord of the eternal covenant promises to us in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you grant all of us today the faith to be true to what we've promised? And may these precious families, and indeed this whole church family, seize upon these wonderful tokens of your abundant grace that you give us today. And so appropriate them with gladness and with joy and with faith that what is done today in marking out these little ones as yours may indeed come to full fruition as they grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And may it stand for all eternity for the glory and honor of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We stand then to sing the... Uh, baptismal hymn number 933 in our blue books. Our children, Lord, in faith and prayer, we bring before your face. Number 933.
please be seated. <clears throat> Let me welcome you once again. Uh, if you're visiting with us uh, today at the Tron, you're very particularly welcome. I hope you'll feel at home with us here as a fellowship of God's people. And uh, hope we have a chance to meet you and greet you after the formal part of the service. should have had on the way in one of these uh, notice sheets here. Um, they tell you all the different things going on today and our different services still to come on the front page. And inside you'll find details about uh, all the different things going on during the life of the church this week. Let me just remind you of uh, Saturday, we have uh, Josh Ward and Katrina Herbert's wedding. So do be praying for them and uh, you're very warmly welcome uh, to go and join them for the service there at Drumclog uh, Church. On the back page, two important notices. One, uh, we're having uh, next Sunday afternoon a membership class. That's for folk who have been with us for a time and uh, would like to join uh, formally in uh, serving with our fellowship here in partnership. If you want to find out more about that, come along next Sunday afternoon at 5. I'll be glad to tell you a little more about that, and it's an opportunity uh, for us to do that together. So please, if you've been with us for a while and you've been thinking that way, uh, don't miss that opportunity. Then please do note very carefully the last uh, notice there, our congregational meeting. Um, we've had to move the date of that, I'm afraid. I'm unavoidably involved in conducting a family funeral on uh, a week on Wednesday, which is when we were... Uh, hoping to have the meeting, and um, the session clerk tells me we can't have the meeting without me, so uh, it's got to be moved. So I'm very sorry about that, but if you can change your diaries and note that we will meet instead on Wednesday, the 6th of June, um, we would have been meeting as a uh, congregation for prayer that evening anyway. So look at it this way, you get a night off on the 30th of May, and uh, we'll do all that business on the, uh, on the 6th of June. Well, I'll let you read the rest of these notices at your leisure. Please do that and uh, keep them by you to use for your prayers throughout the week as we pray for all the different things going on in the life of the church. But we're going to turn now to our uh, reading this morning. It's uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, which if you have uh, one of our visitors' blue Bibles, you'll find on page 557, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We've just recently done um, a little series ranging through some of these wisdom books rather ambitiously taking a book a week, so just dipping our toes into the waters. But um, I want to return for just a few weeks into uh, this fascinating book of Ecclesiastes to spend a little more time here. And um, the title for this little series is Shining Faced Faith in a Fleeting and Fallen World. It's all about how to live with joy. That's what this book is about, how to live with real joy amidst the reality of the life that we are living without pretending that the mess we see all around us isn't really there. That's the call of the Christian gospel, and it's the call of the preacher in Ecclesiastes here. So we're going to read together today chapter 8, verse 1, down to verse 15, which is all about patient joy in the mess of man's sin. Who is like the wise, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Don't take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. The word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, for every matter. Although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be. For who can tell him how it will be? No man has the power to retain the spirit, or perhaps should be translated the wind, or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man had power over man to his hurt. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity, vain, puzzling. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well for those who fear God, because they fear before him. 
but it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. There is a, a vanity, a great puzzle that takes place on earth that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. So I commend joy for man has no good thing under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of life that God has given him under the sun. Amen. And may God bless to us this, his word. Well, as the musicians play quietly now and as our offerings are received, you might like to read more of these words in Ecclesiastes that we'll be studying shortly. As we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, and as we think of this world that we've read about, a world that is so often tinged with mystery, with bafflement for us, with great sadness, with tension, with tragedy, how we thank you that we come before you, the God who is and who towers above the sun, whose throne is set in eternity, and to whom all the issues of time and history belong. We thank you, therefore, Lord, that when we don't even know how to pray with wisdom and with clarity, we may come before you and present our petitions before your throne, simply articulating to you our cares, our concerns, our fears, our desires for justice, for righteousness, for peace, and to know that you are the God who has promised ultimately all of these things. We lift before you the many issues of the world today before us, the ongoing hostilities in the Middle East, the upcoming diplomatic relations between the United States and North Korea, the ongoing sense of crisis over the nuclear deal with the nation of Iran, and many other things besides the worries of the economic world, concerns of the bankers and the planners all throughout the globe, so many upon whom the fortunes of the populations of our nation seem to rest, the elites who seem to know or think they know how to run this world, but so often seem to discount completely the wisdom that comes from heaven, from you, and from your word of truth that you have not hidden from this world, but have revealed to us so plainly and clearly in the gospel of your son and in these scriptures that speak of him. 
We pray, Lord, for that wisdom to be found among the rulers of our nation and the world. We pray that the great ones who gather at great occasions, like the wedding yesterday of the new Duke and Duchess of Sussex, that they would listen and that they would hear the words of truth and light that come only from your word and which alone can give wisdom for life. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of marriage and for family and that great celebration as a nation yesterday of marriage. And we pray for the new Duke and Duchess that you would grant them stability and fidelity, which is the bedrock of true happiness in any marriage and in any relationship that will last. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of marriage and of family life, for these little ones that we've baptized this morning and all the others in our congregation and those imminently expected. Uh, we thank you for the great joys that these bring to our lives and indeed, Lord, the many and abundant joys that you give us to rejoice in and to be glad in and to enjoy and find satisfaction in, even in this world that is so tainted by sin, how good you are. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be a people whose faces shine and radiate the great goodness, not only of your blessings in creation, but for us who know your Son, the abundance, the wonders, the joy inexpressible and full of glory that emanates from this great hope of the gospel of Christ, which you have revealed to us in him. So, Lord, to that end, would you speak to us now as we open your word afresh? This word is life. This word is light. This word alone can lead us through all the changing scenes of life and into the sure and certain hope of the joy of your eternal kingdom. So open our eyes and open our hearts, we pray. And may we hear you speak to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue praying as we sing the words of the song on the screen. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word.
Well, turn with me, if you would, to the passage we uh, read together there in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, page 557, if you have one of the church uh, visitors' Bibles. Charles Dickens once wrote that some women's faces are in their brightness a prophecy, and some in their sadness a history. And whether you're a man or a woman, it's true, isn't it, that our faces tell a story. An astute physician can look at your face, do you know, and he can tell a great deal uh, about the signs of your health or the lack of health in your body. But of course, uh, faces reveal a great deal to all of us, don't they? They do speak of a history. Life's experience is often etched into our faces, whether it's hardships or sorrow or, or bitterness or loss of different kinds. But our faces are also a prophecy because they speak not only of the events of the past, but of our reaction to the life that we've lived, and therefore our attitudes in the present and also our attitude to the future, the attitude of our hearts, which are uh, hidden behind the expression of our faces. I suppose that's why portrait painters and uh, photographers are so often fascinated by faces, because they reveal so eloquently, don't they, so much of a person's character, so much of their story, so much of their innermost being. And some Christians have truly shining faces, faces that, that radiate, that speak of deep joy and peace and, and contentment. But not all Christians' faces are like that. Some believers have hard faces, don't they, stony faces. Faces that prophesy, that tell out a very different message indeed. And the thing is that the, the difference in those faces is not accounted for by the one having had a hard life and the other having had a charmed life. Very often, the most shining faces are those who have gone through the most tough and bitter experiences that life can offer. And the difference is not in life's experiences. The difference is in their reaction to them and the reaction in them. For the one, it's been a path of glad acceptance, a path of submission. And that's led to the sweet fruit of contentment, to the shining face that speaks of real peace with God and indeed peace with the world around. But for others, it's very different. It's a path of resistance, a path of resentment. Resentment and bitterness about all the things that life has thrown into their path. And that is hardened their heart in discontent. And that hardness has is, is become visible to everybody in the, the hard features of their faces, which often look like flint. Now, this book of Ecclesiastes, as we saw when we dipped our toes into it a few weeks ago, it confronts us with a message that life is unpredictable, that life is full of puzzles, full of pain, full of perplexities. And that's true for all of us in different ways. And the question here in the passage in, is uh, in verse 1. Who is wise? Who knows the interpretation of a thing? Who knows the way of wisdom through each perplexing path of life so that life with all its struggles, with all its mysteries, with all its bitterness as well as its joy, so that life will work in us the wisdom that will make our face shine with bright joy even amid the storms of life. Instead of becoming hardened and twisted by our experience of life in this perplexing world, in this life under the sun. Now, that's a big question. Because there are many Christians whose faces sadly do harden throughout their lives. Because their hearts have, have become embittered with disappointments, with letdowns, with bad experiences, terrible experiences of all kinds of different things. And it could be that you are one of those people, or it could be that you're on the way to becoming one of those sad Christians. And if that's the case, then the preacher is talking to you. He's talking to all of us. Because the truth is, without his word, without his instruction, all of us would go that way. That's the truth. So we really need to listen to his words. What is the key then to the shining face? 
Well, the key, as this book tells us so plainly, is never, ever a flight into fantasy, into denial, into a world of let's pretend. No, it's absolutely the opposite. It's about learning the way of submission to reality, to the world as it really is under the sun. And meeting life's realities with acceptance instead of meeting them with anger. And in particular, in this long section right through to, to chapter 9, uh, verse 10, uh, he's focusing on two things that we have to come to terms with, things that we find very, very difficult indeed. The first we'll look at today in verses 1 to 15 of chapter 8, and that is living with the manifest injustice of a sinful world. But then next time we're going to look at another difficulty we have, which is almost as hard, and that is living with the mysterious justice of a sovereign God. And we have to come to terms with living in a world with both these realities, whether we like it or not. And the wisdom that alone leads us to joy, to a shining face, and not a hardened face, lies in the way not of anger and resistance to these things, but in the way of acceptance, in the way of submission. And that's just what God plainly tells us is true. And it's what just honest observation of the world all around about us tells us is equally true. We can so easily delude ourselves and live in a cocoon of let's pretend, but the Bible faces us up with hard facts. So let's look at this passage in a little more uh, detail. These verses turn our focus very deliberately to the manifest injustice in this sinful world. And the message can be summed up this way. You must live patiently and with joy even amid the mess of man's sinfulness. In other words, real wisdom knows and accepts the limitations of a world that is sinfully corrupt. And it will never be otherwise under this sun. In a nutshell, the shining face of contentment belongs to the believer who has learned to live with mess. Look at verses 1 to 6. It's all about the king's court. And the point's clear. Even though there might be foolishness, there might be injustice, even there, you are a fool if you think you can simply ignore his authority and assert yourself every time you think you know better. So he says, keep the king's command. Be wise. Don't go storming out of the king's presence with a face like thunder. Don't take your stand against him in an evil cause, verse 3. Don't persist in that kind of futile behavior. Why? <laughs> because the king's in charge. The king does what he pleases. Verse 4, his word is supreme. Now oh, you see, look at verse 5. The way to avoid evil and misfortune coming your way is to do what? It's to accept the place of authority. Why? Because it's simple reality. It's all about, isn't it? It's an attitude to living under authority. Especially when that authority might seem unjust and even evil at times. It's about how we cope when the authority and the rule above us irks us and annoys us. And there's only two ways. One is a spirit of rebellion. It's rejection of that authority. You let it get under your skin. You let it embitter you. You let it give you a hard face. The other is the opposite. It's the way of submission and acceptance that learns the wisdom of discretion not becoming bitter, adapting to the realities of life, a life which will never be perfect. That's the way to have a shining face, even though times are sometimes very difficult. Now, some people find living and working under somebody else's authority very difficult indeed. And some people find it so hard that it causes no end of angst, no end of anger and bitterness. And it can make you into a very bitter, angry person, if that's you. But the reality is, friends, that the authority structures in our world, however flawed they are, they are something that God has put into the fabric of our world for our protection. Look at verse 2. Obey the king's voice. Why? Because of God's oath to him. That's why in Proverbs 24, verse 21, it says, Fear the Lord and the king, my son, and don't join in with the rebellious. The kingship in Israel was God's institution, even when it was corrupt, so it couldn't be ignored. Yes, God would judge wicked kings, but you can't ignore his rule. 
And the New Testament is just as clear, isn't it, about our governing authorities today in our world. They're ordained by God. They're part of God's merciful ordering of this world for our protection. That's why Peter, the apostle, can even say to Christians who are living very probably under the dreadful reign of Nero, that's why he can say, fear God and honor the emperor. Because even bad government is far better than total anarchy. Just look at some of the, the countries in the world today. Look at Syria and other places. We can see that. But this is a sinful world, so even pretty good, even pretty uncorrupt government, as we have, is always going to have injustices, always going to have incompetences. There's going to be all sorts of reasons for us to become angry and resentful and bitter. And the point is, the preacher says, are you going to let that eat you up and poison your whole life, or are you going to come to terms with reality in a sinful world and accept these things? And learn to live with the, the limitations of a world which is awaiting recreation and which will not be perfect until that day comes. Will you learn to live with mess so as to overcome it with patient hope, with joyous hope? That's such an important question. <laughs> not just at the, the, the level of politics and rule and so on. Some people may be very taken up with that sort of thing. But also it impinges upon our daily lives every day in every way. Most of us who work, we work under authority. And most of us who work under authority, we feel most of the time, or at least some of the time, we know a jolly lot better than our boss, don't we? Of course we do. And sometimes we're driven mad by their incompetence or by their injustice. Well, are you going to let that harden your face? Are you going to let that embitter your heart? Are you going to let it give you an ulcer? Make you a cynical, unhappy person. Live with a, a permanent chip on your shoulder. Or is the hope of the Christian gospel about what you know about the reality of eternity and the priority of eternity, are you going to get, let that principally affect your life so that your face will shine even in the midst of these things? Maybe you're a teacher. Quite a few of you are. You're driven mad with the latest bits of things the government is dropping on you and giving you to do in terms of crazy paperwork and so on. Or maybe you're a doctor or a nurse or a therapist. Maybe you work in the NHS and you're just absolutely sick and tired of all the latest reorganization when the last one is only just finished. Or maybe you're in business or you're a tradesman and you're being driven demented right now by the new data protection thing. Or the fears about Brexit or all the latest things. What about it? Well, the preacher says... Don't be hardened by these things. You're a believer. You understand reality. You understand that this is an unjust, sinful world. So learn to live patiently, as God does, with the tragedy of human sin. Don't be the kind of person who, who storms out and resigns at the first little irritation with your boss. Don't be the kind of person who's endlessly pursuing disputes that you know that you can never actually win in this world. Embrace reality. But as a Christian, see the bigger picture and smile. See, a wise believer knows what verses 5 and 6 say here, that there's a time and a way for everything. And that includes God's judgment. It will bring injustice and wickedness to book in the end. Verse 6, for there's a time and a way for everything, literally for every matter. It's the same as in chapter 3, verse 17, where it says, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter. Be patient, he's saying. We know the bigger story. And we know God's timing, and we can trust God's timing. This current injustice is not forever. And God's justice will prevail in his good time. Sometimes, yes, that will be in our lifetime. Sometimes we will see it. But certainly, without doubt, we shall see it ultimately. God will bring every deed to judgment. That's how the book ends, chapter 12, verse 14. And you see, knowing that and really believing that is the only thing that can help us endure this world with shining faces. No matter what trouble, verse 6, literally what evil 
we might have to bear in this life. And we need that anchor, don't we? Because life is hard. Look at verse 7. It's true, isn't it? No one can control our own times. We can't predict all of life for ourselves. Neither can anyone else. We have to face up to our ignorance. We have to face up to our powerlessness. So much in life is just beyond us. And until we accept that reality about our lives, until we live, learn to live with these huge limitations on our lives, we will never be at peace in this world. That's not to say, of course, we can never change anything or we shouldn't bother to try and challenge injustices and evils where we see them. Of course we should. We're commanded to love our neighbors. Christians all through the ages have done so much to bring about change. Yes, of course. It's not passivity that the preacher is advocating here, but it is patience. It is realism. You have to realize that you cannot and you will not change everything. This will be a world of sin and wickedness and injustice right till the end. That's what Jesus himself tells us so clearly. In this world's governments and institutions and societies, in our whole country all around about us, no matter what happens, in your life, in your work, in the relationships that we all have, everywhere. And unless we realize that and accept it and live patiently with the tragedy of sin, friends, it will make you bitter, it will harden your heart, and it will give you an unhappy face. There's some things we just cannot control in life. Look at verse 8. The wind, or the spirit, as uh, our Bible translates, or the day of death. No one escapes that war of mortality, do they? And of course, that also is a comfort, isn't it? Because the king, the unjust ruler, the evil one, they won't escape it either. Their time will come. But that is life as we know it. Verse 9. That's what the preacher sees. That's what we see in a world where man has power over man to his hurt. A manifest injustice of our sinful world. We can't deny it. But remember, it's a temporary situation. Verse 10, the wicked too will come to their grave. It's hard to know in verse 10 whether we should take it as printed or as the footnote suggests, whether it's the wicked are forgotten or, or praised. If it's praise that's correct, then it means that the injustice extends even to the funeral. The wicked are eulogized at the funeral in the very place where they did their evil works. Well, that's true, isn't it? Who ever heard a real crook called for what he actually is at his funeral? No, he's always the greatest fellow that's ever lived. But if it means forgotten, then the emphasis is simply that the evil also will die. He'll come to an end. He'll soon be forgotten. Their power is not lasting power. And either way, that latter point is taken up in verses 11 to 13. This really is a vanity. People live with the fantasy that God is dead, that God is powerless, that there's no judgment to come. And because people don't meet reprisals immediately for their wickedness, well, they conclude there's no judgment. We can live as we please. They set their hearts fully to do evil, verse 11. Well, nothing has changed, has it? That's our world thinks nothing of the coming judgment of God. That's why Peter wrote in his letter to the Christians that the last days would be marked out by exactly that. People saying, where's this judgment? The world is just as it's always been. Nothing will ever change. No, 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 says the preacher here. It may seem that you can oppose God with impunity, that you can live to a right old age. It may seem you can do evil a hundred times, he says, and preserve your life. But I know, says the preacher, but the ultimate story is very different. It will be well with those who fear God, he says, ultimately. Why? Because they fear God. Not because they're morally superior, but because they fear God. But not so the wicked, verse 13. They will not prolong their days like a shadow. Why? Because they do not fear God. And they're living under a complete illusion that there is no ultimate judgment. And so they live carefree lives, flagrantly denying God's justice. But God is not powerless. He's just patient. And he will, as the preacher keeps reminding us, he will bring every deed to judgment. And knowing that, you see, and believing that, and allowing that fact of God's clear revelation from above the sun to permeate our whole life here on this earth, that is the key to living patiently and joyfully 
in the midst of the tragedy of sin, in the midst of the mess, the injustice of this human world. Viewed only from planet Earth, well, yes, life is a vanity. It's a total enigma, verse 14. Bad things happen to good people, and good things seem to only happen to the wicked. That is a huge enigma, a vanity, a puzzle, an evil, an injustice. But, says the Bible, if you listen to God's revelation, if you listen to his explanation from above the sun, then you shouldn't be surprised. It's just what to expect in a fallen, sinful world. How can it be other? And we can accept it and bear it and live patiently in the midst of it because we know that. We know more. That this is not just the whole story. And we can trust God and trust him to be God. And not become bitter that he hasn't been God in the way we want him to be God, as if we were God. I would do it this way, God. And that's why, you see, the, uh, the preacher's prescription for life in a world of mess is not despair, but it's verse 15. It's joy. And so I commend joy. For man has no good thing under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. If you want to be a Christian with a shining face, not a stony face... You'll be the kind of believer, he says, who is always counting your blessings, not cataloging your complaints. But amid all the mysteries, all the enigmas that we can't solve, there are blessings to enjoy. In fact, we're commanded to enjoy them by God. And we can learn to be satisfied even with the many dissatisfactions of life, not just dissatisfied even among the many satisfactions in life that God gives us. But that joy in this world is only possible when we stop resisting the reality of our own limitations. And when we live patiently with the tragedy of sin, knowing that in this world, it's true, we have no abiding city, no eternal home. But we're waiting for that world to come. And that's the person who can say, in the midst of all the mess, I commend joy. Like Paul from a Roman prison, he writes to the Philippians, rejoice always. Again, I say it, rejoice. I've, I've learned contentment, whatever the circumstances, he says. Or writing to the Corinthians, where he says he's afflicted, he's perplexed, he's persecuted, he's struck down, and yet not crushed, not despairing, not destroyed. We do not lose heart, he says. Why? Because this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things which are seen, the present injustice of this world, but to the things that are unseen, the loving justice of God that is coming. For the things that are seen, they are transient, says Paul. But the things that are unseen as of now, they are the eternal things. That's just the New Testament way of saying exactly what the preacher in Ecclesiastes is saying right here. And don't we need to hear that message? I certainly do repeatedly in my life. Because it's so easy, isn't it, as Christian believers even, to become people who are hardened by the injustice of this fallen sinful world. We look at the world, we look at our lives, we look at our own experience, and we find ourselves saying so often, no, it's so unfair. There's so much to make us angry, so much to make us resentful, bitter. But you see, the Bible tells us that's not just wrong for us. It's so very damaging. It's destructive. It makes us miserable. That attitude, if you let it engulf you, it will make you miserable and it will rob you of the many manifold joys that God has given to us right in the midst of this messy world. That attitude will take all the shine off your face because it will rob you of all the joy that should be in your heart and it will make you bitter and hard. It'll harden your face, which is an expression of your inner life because it's hardened your heart and allowed you to be eaten up with that bitterness. So let me ask you, is your joy in life at something of a low ebb this morning? Has the shine perhaps come off your face? Is this world, is your life, is your family, your work, your general walk, is it getting you down? Is it filling you with so much unfairness, so much annoyance? So much injustice seeming to flourish all around about you. So much misery when you see people who deserve nothing getting everything and people who deserve so much more getting nothing. 
Well, if that's you today, the preacher here is, is saying to you, you need to do two things again and again if you are not to become or are not to remain a hardened person, an embittered person with a hard face. You need to be remembering and you need to be rejoicing. You need to remember heaven's perspective on our life here under the sun. And that has two parts. First of all, it means submitting to present realities of what the Bible plainly tells us and what we can see with our own eyes, that this is a world of injustice. It is a world of sin. It won't be right until the Lord Jesus comes again to remake this universe completely. And friends, if that is what it takes for God to set this world to rights, how can we possibly delude ourselves to think that something we can do can somehow or other make it right before then? That's to deny the gospel. And we have to live patiently and joyfully with the tragedy of sin in so many areas of life. We need to live with mess. And until that great day, as chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes says, there are so many things that are crooked that just cannot be made straight. And the only way of satisfaction, in fact, the only way of sanity, is for us to accept that, to submit to that. Not to try and fight against it and disbelieve it and pretend it's not so. And that's very hard for us. For some, it might be the whole realm of, of politics and social change. Maybe you're rightly concerned for issues of justice and, and betterment of people, both nationally and internationally. I hope we all are. We're all called, aren't we, as Christians, to, to love our neighbors, to show compassion wherever we can. But you see, if we allow ourselves to become so consumed with zeal in that whole area that we think that if only we can achieve this thing in politics, if only we can achieve that thing in economics, if only we can change this thing in our society, then everything will be marvelous. Friends, if we're doing that, we are deluding ourselves. We'll never be happy in this world if that's us. Maybe in your job or in your career or in your marriage in your family life, or even in church life, as long as, as secretly deep down you've got the idea that if only we had this or did that or did the other thing or achieved something, then we'd overcome all these injustices, all these frustrations, all these aggravations and be at peace. <laughs> Friends, you will only ever be disappointed, let me tell you. Remember, says the preacher, this is an unjust, sinful world. This world is tinged in every part with the tragedy of human sin. If you don't remember that constantly, you will go mad with frustration. And you'll end up becoming a very bitter-hearted person. Look at your life today and ask yourself the question, what if this is as good as it gets? Because let me tell you, it may very well be as good as it's going to get. Can you ever be satisfied? Can you ever be happy? The answer to that question will tell you if you have understood the Christian gospel. Are you going to let your sleep be worried, uh, uh, robbed by worry constantly? Are you going to let resentments about your work or your family or whatever it is fester in your heart forever? Are you going to be longing constantly for a justice that will never be possible in this fallen world? The preacher says, remember, and keep remembering heaven's perspective on life under the sun, the present realities of this fallen world and all its mess. And because you're a Christian believer, you need to also remember the second part of that heavenly reality, which is the future certainty of the kingdom of Christ, which is to come, that it will be well for those who fear God. Life beyond the sun is a real and future certainty for all the people of God. There is a great day of God's salvation coming. There's a great day of redemption coming. And because of that promise, says Paul, we can rejoice now in the glory of God and in the hope that that glory gives us. That is what will make us rejoice now, even amid sufferings. And that's what we constantly need to be remembering when we're surrounded by so many vexations in life, in an unjust world, in a world that is under the sun, frustrating. If we won't face realism about the abiding facts of this fallen world, if we won't live patiently with a mess of sin, then we're deluding ourselves. 
And eventually, friends, what happens with people who do that is that reality overtakes them. And very often their faith collapses. Because it wasn't real faith. It was fantasy. It was delusion. It was escapism. Not real Christian faith. But if we don't focus our lives equally on the future hope of the gospel and on the judgment to come and on the reality of the great reversal that is promised, then we would despair, wouldn't we? And we would be crushed by the pain of life under the sun. But when we remember all this, the whole truth and a realism and the hope of the Christian gospel, well, then we will be able for the second R. Our remembering will enable us to be constantly rejoicing. Rejoicing in heaven's provision for life, even now, even under the sun. That is what verse 15 tells us. We'll be able to find joy, even in the midst of pain and perplexity. Joy in all the good gifts of our Creator and our Redeemer. Joy in just simple things like daily life, food and drink and friendship, however imperfect it might be. And in our daily labors that God gives us. However, ultimately, these things can never satisfy. And in so many other things in this life. And we'll be able to do that and find joy. Because we've set our faces on the glory of the world to come. And in the glory of the Christ who is coming. That's the only place, the preacher says, you can find the wisdom that will make your face shine brightly with joy. Whatever this world might throw at you. Do you remember how we're told in the Gospels that the face of the Lord Jesus shone like the sun when he was up on the mountain of transfiguration with his disciples? Even though his mind was fully set on what was about to happen as he set his face fully towards Jerusalem and to the cross and to the death that awaited him. But his face shone like the sun because he saw also before him the glory of his kingdom. And it's no different for all of those whom Jesus calls to be disciples, to follow him in that train, for you and for me. Let me finish by what Peter writes to the church. Just listen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, although now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes even though it's tried by fire so that your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, if we really understand that, the hope of the true Christian gospel, even amid the tragedy of this world as it really is, then we will live with daily joy and with faces that shine and show the way to that joy to a watching world. Let's pray. I commend joy. For man has no good thing under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil throughout the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Our Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you have opened the heavens and spoken into the darkness of this earth. In all the words of the prophets from the very beginning, but above all, in these last days, in the glory and magnificence of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we see not only the exact imprint of your nature, but in whom we also have 
the sure and certain hope of glory through his resurrection from the dead. So keep us remembering all the truth of your gospel and keep us rejoicing all the days of our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing as we close a hymn that reminds us of these great truths. Ages pass by, earth's treasures all decay, all Christ's creation long to see his day, but constantly the eye of faith can see your plan unfolds, O Holy Trinity. Number 235 in our blue hymn books. Lord, may we sing these words with truth and with meaning, that they would be real for us, expressing the trust of our hearts, especially, especially if we are, even this day, walking under the dark shadow of many evils. Grant us, we pray, a remembering of hope, and so the rejoicing of your peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and until that day. Amen.